move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Allen from Texas. And uh, we all have seen his videos while learning oculoplasty. He has around three, more than 300 videos of oculoplasty in his YouTube channel. Over to you, sir, for uh, describing the indications of orbital fracture repair. All right, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is just current recommendations for orbital fracture repair. So a much simpler uh, topic compared to what, we, what Dr. Shields just, uh, just presented. I have no financial disclosures. I, I'd just like to start with some quotes from my clinic. Um, first one is, I don't see it, doc. Second one is, I don't look in that direction. And then the third one is, I don't know how to measure 50% of the floor. So are there any hard and fast rules for orbital floor and medial wall fractures? So again, we're just gonna be talking about blowout fractures. So not NOEs, not ZMCs and not Lefort fractures. And I think really what it comes down to is what the indications are for the repair and what the timing is for the repair. When we think about blowouts in general, again, this should just be medial wall or orbital floor. The rim should not be fractured. If the rim is fractured, then you need to think that there is an associated, uh, associated facial fracture. We sort of think of this as a protective mechanism for the globe. Uh, there's thin, bin, thin bone on the floor as well as the medial wall. And basically there's very little resistance to fracture on the side of the sinus. So when we look at our orbital floor, this should not involve the zygoma. The zygoma is a very thick bone. This should be involving really just the maxillary bone. Sometimes this extends to the ethmoid bone. This should not go posterior to the pterygopalatine fossa. So sort of the anatomy of the orbital floor fracture. Um, when we look at the medial wall, again, this should not extend superior to the frontal ethmoidal suture. Again, this may extend close to the optic canal, should not be anterior to the posterior lacrimal crest, might involve, uh, involve a little bit of the lacrimal bone, and then again, can extend to the orbital floor. So we sort of have these isolated orbital floors, isolated medial wall fractures, and then we have a combined medial wall and orbital floor fracture. So what are the sequela of blowout fractures? Well, we have increased orbital volume and this can result in inophthalmus and later fat atrophy can contribute to this. If we get tissue prolapse or entrapment into the fracture, we can get a restrictive strabismus. Again, I always say that a uh, entrapment is a clinical diagnosis, not a radiological diagnosis. So this is something that uh, don't believe your radiologist necessarily with regards to entrapment. I think that this is a clinical diagnosis and we'll talk about that later. You can also get damage not only to the sensory but also the motor nerves. And so you can get V2 hypesthesia and then you can get a paralytic strabismus. And how do we figure out, well, what's the difference between a paralytic and a restrictive strabismus? Usually we're gonna do four suctions. So this is a, a kid with a left medial wall fracture, and I'm having him look to his right, and you see that he has a paralytic strabismus. Now, we don't treat paralytic strabismus with surgery after trauma. In general, we let this resolve on its own. So if he has, has negative force suctions, I am not going to treat him. And again, how do we figure out if someone has positive force suctions? To me, this is usually an intraoperative uh, maneuver. And what I mean by that is that I rarely do this in the clinic, um, but I do do this before and after surgery in the operating room to prove that I have, I have a restrictive strabismus. And then secondly, at the end of the surgery that I have, that I have uh, released that, that tissue. So I think one of the biggest things to always remember is that there are differences with regards to indications and timing of repair depending upon age. In children, uh, you know, bone bends and this may incarcerate tissue. So this is basically a green stick, green stick fracture. This has implications for repair. And we always have to remember that these fractures can be missed by the radiologist. Whereas in adults, as we get older, our bone gets brittle, it breaks and we get larger fractures. So with regards to timing of repair, we think of this thing of, a, of a, in children as a wide-eye blowout fracture where the bone bends, incarcerates the tissue, in particular, the inferior rectus muscle. And then if this muscle is not released, the muscle can become ischemic. <clears throat> There's really no controversy regarding the indication or timing of repair for this type of fracture. We try to repair these fractures within 12 to 24 hours. And 
this is not a mystery when they come into the emergency room or into your clinic. Um, you know, I've seen these, these, these fractures occur in patients as old as uh, 20 years, but when they present to you, they have extreme limitation of up gaze and gone down gaze. They may have bradycardia with eye movement. They have significant pain with eye movement. They don't want you to touch them in the emergency room and they're often nauseated. And so this is our typical picture of a kid with a wide eye uh, blowout fracture. Why do we call it a wide eye blowout fracture? Because they really look pretty good externally. They don't have a lot of hemorrhage or anything. And when I have him look up and look down, this eye does not move at all. And so when we look at the CT from this patient on coronal, we're looking at the left side and we see this muscle start to dive into the fracture. And then as we move posteriorly, you know, we sometimes call this the missing muscle sign in the sense that you lose the inferior rectus. Why do we lose the inferior rectus? Because it's on the other side of the fracture, it's in the sinus. And so you can imagine that this muscle being caught in this tight fracture is not good for it in the sense that it's gonna become ischemic. If it's not released, if it becomes ischemic, it dies. And then you have a muscle that's neither going to contract nor relax. And so, you know, if you don't repair these patients relatively quickly, they're going to have this very narrow window of single binocular vision potentially for the rest of their life. So we like to repair these very, very quickly. So here he is after surgery, looks much more healthy in the sense that he's no longer looking miserable or sick, no longer looking green, having him look up in complete, uh, complete motility if you get these guys closely enough. So adult blowout fractures are really where the controversy arise, arises and are, resides. And I spend a lot of my time protecting patients from surgeons who wanna operate on orbital fractures. And you know, it's not so much my oculoplastics colleagues, but I think it's a lot of my uh, otolaryngology colleagues as well as my maxillofacial surgeon colleagues who are still sort of believing the traditional teaching that has been out there for many, many years with regards to the indications for repair of orbital fractures. So let's talk a little bit about in ophthalmos. So if we look at many of the books, traditionally, they say that two millimeters more of in ophthalmos is significant enough to operate. And there have been quite a few studies that show that, gosh, you know, patients really don't notice two millimeters of in ophthalmos or proptosis or, you know, axial difference between their two sides. And so for me, I really let the patient decide how much in ophthalmos is significant to them. So what does that mean? I have them come back after their orbital fracture. If they have formal, full motility and I, and I am measuring some in ophthalmos, I basically ask them if they notice it. The vast majority of young males, if they don't have any double vision, they don't want surgery. And, you know, to be quite truthful, an older patient who, you know, would have to undergo general anesthesia, and if they're anticoagulated, you might have to stop their anticoagulants and put them at risk. They really don't care if they have two, even three, maybe even four millimeters of inophthalmos. However, on the flip side, I have had a few patients who complain of one millimeter of inophthalmos. <laughs> gosh, is this, is this true or is this, uh, you know, something that I'm not noticing? Fracture size, traditionally 50% or more of the floor was considered to be an indication for, for repair, but now I really treat the patient, not the scan. I do not do surgery to prevent up in ophthalmos. I treat the ophthalmos if it's noted by the patient and usually see the patient two weeks after trauma, have them follow up in a month. And lastly, with regards to strabismus, traditionally, even if, if there's evidence of restrictive strabismus two weeks after the fracture, you know, basically, traditionally, it was thought that if it's there at two weeks, you should operate, but rarely do I do that. I see them at two weeks and ask them if their double vision is continuing, continuing to improve, if they even notice the double vision, and then decide what to do from there. So if we have this small fracture, I'm finishing up just here quickly. Uh, you know, most of us would not feel the need to operate, even though the radiologist may claim that there's entrapment there. However, in a bigger fracture such as this, she has restricted restriction to up gaze at two weeks, larger fracture probably is going to need to be operated. So who said what, you know, coming back to our first quotes, I don't see it, doc. That was my 25 year old with three millimeters of bit ophthalmos. So I said, you know, your eyes sort of sunken in. Do you want to do something about that? 
he didn't want to do anything. Lastly, or secondly, I don't look in that direction. That was my 75 year old who had significant up gaze restriction that I could elicit in clinic, but she said, you know, I just don't look in that direction. And then lastly, I don't know how to measure 50% of the floor. That was me because I really don't know how to measure 50% of the floor when I see these fractures. I know if it's a big fracture or a small fracture, but what does 50% really mean? Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it.